Welcome back, students. This is Module 4.3.1, Introduction to Evolution. Um, before we really get into it, I wanted to say a couple of things just in general. First, that evolution is not a belief system. It is a scientific concept, and it really does not have a role in defining religion or religious beliefs. Um, evolution within the realm of science is a theory. Uh, and, of course, a theory means something substantially different to a scientist and to a layperson. Uh, you don't get better than a theory in science. It's very, very, uh, uh, theories are accepted as valid. There's much evidence in their support. And finally, although there is some contention about evolution, it is not uh, really, there is not really amongst scientists or scientific organizations. And I recognize that each of you has your own view of the world and your own opinion about evolution, but this class is not about the opinions of students. This is about the consensus of modern science, and that's what we will focus on. Uh, and so your beliefs are your own to mold and keep as you wish, but I'm just going to give you the facts about evolution as they are used in modern science. Now, we can start off by defining evolution as simply change over time. And many things evolve from language to car styles to hairstyles. Uh, and if you Google evolution, uh, you'll get all sorts of different uh, evolutionary lineages. When we talk about evolution in this class, so what we're talking about is we're talking about biological evolution, which is defined as a change in a population's genetic structure over time. And unless I specifically say otherwise, when I use the word evolution in here, I mean biological evolution. Evolution explains how life has changed over the 3.7 or 3.9 billion years uh, that it's been on Earth. Evolution is an integrating concept that can explain both the similarity and the diversity of life. Two very divergent ideas that are explained by the same idea. It tells you how important and robust the concept of evolution is. Of course, the ma a major mechanism of evolution is worked out by Charles Darwin. Uh, evolution is the keystone of modern biology. The keystone, as you can see here, is an element of uh, classical architecture, of course, if you know your physics, you know all these ve vector forces are coming up and, and pointing right at this keystone. If you pull it out, the arch will collapse. And so it is with modern biology. It is the integrating theme of modern biology. It underlies virtually all other concepts of biology. So uh, evolution explains similarity and diversity and, of course, the relatedness of life. It also explains things that you read about on a fairly frequent basis in the newspaper, such as the development of resistance to antibiotics by bacteria, the development of resistance to pesticides by insects. This also explains why we have to get a new flu shot each year because the virus which causes influenza or the flu evolves. And um, therefore, it, it's really important, especially for students that are going into biology, to understand that evolution is not only a theoretical consideration. Uh, understanding evolution saves lives. It's not just uh, uh, modern science is not a, a smorgasbord that we can pick and choose from. Uh, it comes all in one. And evolution is, of course, one of those big ideas. Um, one of the questions that sometimes arises in the mind of people is why did we have to wait for a Victorian biologist to develop an evolutionary concept? And so here I give you some reasons, at least uh, uh, as to why uh, we didn't have an evolutionary concept sooner. Uh, one concept was the belief in a very young Earth, uh, the idea that the Earth had been created just a few thousand years ago. And uh, Bishop Usher, he actually calculated the age of the Earth from the Old Testament genealogies. If you know the Old Testament, there are some um, books of the Old Testament. I think of Isaiah, but there are others as well that have page after page of so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so. Those are the genealogies, and Bishop Usher claimed that he was able to use them uh, to precisely calculate how old the earth was. And the date he came up with, he said the earth was created in the year 4004 B.C., 
Uh, and he got more specific. He said it was created on Sunday, October 23rd. But wait, but there's more. He said that it was created at 9 o'clock a.m. And indeed, Bishop Usher, that is too much detail. It makes it uh, makes one smile to hear that you believe that you could actually make such a precise calculation from such uh, imprecise uh, data. So the belief in the young earth, as long as we bl uh, people believe that the earth was so very young, just a few thousand years, uh, there simply wasn't time for a realistic evolutionary mechanism to create the diversity of species that we see on the earth. And so as a consequence, it really impaired the development of an evolutionary concept. A second uh, obstacle to developing an evolutionary concept in biology was the belief in the fixity of species. This is the idea that a deity created all the species, and they were created perfectly, and therefore they did not change. Uh, this was associated with the concept of Aristotle called the great chain of being, or the scala natura. And uh, the scala natura, this actually is a pictorial representation where it shows God on a throne and Jesus there, uh, angels here, and then, uh, well, I'm not sure, humans or angels, maybe two rows of angels, archangels and angels, I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, the original Scala Natura was created by Aristotle, and it was Christians who later added the top layers with angels and gods and such. Uh, but nevertheless, it was the idea that there was this hierarchy of complexity uh, in nature and... Uh, Anyway, the, the idea that there was this fixity, this fixedness in nature uh, was also an impairment to the development of an evolutionary concept. A third obstacle uh, was simply perhaps the first two incorporated into its own uh, point, and that's rigid religious views. Um, historically, uh, political power and religious uh, beliefs were commingled. And this was very problematic to free thinking. Uh, and free thinking, of course, is required to develop an evolutionary concept. Uh, kings ruled by divine right. Uh, a monarch said that I am king because God wants me to be king. And uh, you shouldn't question God. And so anything that questioned God uh, or the, the primacy, the centrality of God uh, was frowned upon by the political powers, by the kings, because they ruled by religious uh, right. And so it was, a, I think, a pretty bad situation. Uh, you can learn more about this in your history class, I suppose. And there was a fourth obstacle, and this was simply that we didn't know enough. There was a lack of biological knowledge. We hadn't explored the ecosystems of the world, and we hadn't seen that much biology uh, in the era of modern science. And so our general ignorance uh, limited the advancement of an evolutionary concept. Um, I like here Bart Simpson down there. See what he's writing. I will not expose the ignorance of the faculty. So make sure that you don't. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, there, we did have some evolutionary concepts that preceded uh, Darwin. One was the idea of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Uh, and he proposed that evolution occurred by inheritance of acquired characteristics. So that's the name of his idea, inheritance of acquired characteristics. Now, just the name tells us something, acquired characteristics. These are characteristics that were not present in an organism's uh, genotype or phenotype, but were acquired during its lifetime and then later passed on to the offspring. At least that was a belief. And so it was the belief that phenotypic features that were acquired in life, and especially Lamarck emphasized use and disuse, that if you use something, it got larger, and if you didn't use it, it atrophied or, or shriveled away. Uh, and somehow that these were absorbed into the genotype and passed to the offspring. And in addition to emphasizing use and disuse, inner need uh, was also a major concept there. Uh, an example of a really rudimentary Lamarckian experiment uh, would be to cut off the tails of mice and expect their offspring, uh, offspring to be born without tails. Um, one example in kind of the modern historical era was that of Trofim Lysenko. He had a position which was the equivalent of agricultural secretary in the USSR, the, uh, the Soviet Union. And he kind of had a Lamarckian basis. He was supposed to be the head of uh, Soviet 
agriculture, but his beliefs, uh, these really pseudoscientific beliefs, put Soviet agriculture behind so that uh, you may, you probably don't remember, but maybe you learned in your history class that uh, uh, during uh, the SALT talks, uh, which actually stands for, I guess, uh, Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, uh, so I don't guess you wouldn't say SALT talks, but during the SALT negotiations, um, we, use, we, the United States, used wheat sales as a major negotiating tool, and they had to bend to us because they weren't producing enough food to feed their people because of the uh, Lysenkoism uh, that had put them behind. Lysenkoism is known as a form of pseudoscience, uh, and it's really the idea that you have a, a conclusion that your experiments support. You know the conclusion in advance. And this is what uh, Lysenko looked like right there. Quite a true believer, I guess. Um, and here's some ideas, by the way. Uh, here's an uh, illustration, rather, of the ideas of Lamarck. Uh, shows a short-necked giraffe whose neck grows longer throughout its lifetime and because of inner need and using it and stretching it. And so when it reproduces, its uh, young have longer necks. Now, this is not how it works. Um, this shows kind of a, a similar kind of thing, Lamarckian uh, changes, which it's easy to smile at, but Lamarck showed a lot of courage. He knew that species changed, he saw fossils, he saw the evidence, and he he bravely tried to come up with a, a mechanism. And although we can smile at it, because uh, he didn't have the under, all the understanding that he needed, nevertheless, he showed great uh, intellectual courage, and maybe even physical courage, in putting out this kind of idea. Um, uh, another person who contributed to our uh, the journey to a concept of an uh, to an evolutionary concept in modern science was Thomas Malthus. Malthus was an economist. And he wrote a very influential essay. It was called "Essay on the Principles of Population," um, and this essay is very. Uh, interesting to read today, but Darwin read it in his time, and it helped to influence Darwin's thinking. Uh, Malthus made two uh, major points and then drew a conclusion from them. His first point were, was that populations reproduce geometrically or exponentially, while food sources, the second point, uh, food sources increase arithmetically or linearly. And so because populations reproduce more quickly than food sources, uh, Thomas Malthus predicted for humans that there would be a more offspring than could survive and that poverty, famine, and disease would be the result. And that was his conclusion, that human suffering was pretty much inevitable. Uh, and that's made uh, Thomas Malthus the first of, <laughs> uh, I don't know the first, but it made him a famous doomsayer. And what do doomsayers say? They say doom. <laughs> so he was saying uh, humans are in for a bad time. And, of course, there's a famous bumper sticker around. It says Malthus was right. I guess we lost right there. It dropped off. But nevertheless, uh, Charles Darwin later read this, um, this prediction that Malthus made of suffering and death for humans. And he realized that those same principles uh, were visible in nature, that many species produced more offspring than could survive, and that there was a struggle for survival. Uh, here, this uh, the artwork on this particular slide is an engraving by Albrecht Durer of the force, four horsemen of the apocalypse, conquest, war, famine, and death. And with that, we will conclude our first module of evolution.